Welcome to your College Bound Kid, a podcast for parents, college counselors, students, and anyone who wants a weekly deep dive into the world of college admissions. My name is Julia. I was an admission officer at Haverford College, an outside reader for Emory University, and I currently work as a school-based counselor at a school in Massachusetts. I'm Lisa, and I'm a clinical psychologist and college counselor. I have a daughter in college, a daughter in high school, and a son in middle school. After 30 years in Chicago, we recently moved to North Carolina. My name is Mark. I'm a college coach in Atlanta and the parent of two daughters, Karis, a graduate of Davidson College, and she is the founder of the Spanish tutoring company, SpanishHelpToday.com. And Joy is a wellness coach at the Kenan Flagler Business School at the University of North Carolina, Chapel Hill. And I'm so blessed to be able to work alongside both my beautiful daughters at School Match for You, a college counseling firm that I founded in 2010. This week in the news, Julie and I are going to pick up where we left off. So we started talking about the senior year grades matter. Now we're going to talk about something a little different. We're going to talk about what are you supposed to do if you drop a class senior year? Like, are you supposed to communicate that? Do you communicate that? Does the school counselor communicate that? Do you not communicate that? So we're going to talk about that. And then our roundtable's back. We're finishing up our conversation about video submissions, you know, and then we will continue to have our interview with Jay Rosner. And we're looking at just a bunch of different things you can do if you're going to take the test to get the best score. A range of things you need to think about, like when you start and how do you prep and how long do you prep and how many days a week and do you take breaks and do you do, you know, self prep versus group prep versus one. I mean, we talk about all of it. It's part two of four. And then Linda and Lisa will have part two of their college spotlight on Furman University in Spartanburg, South Carolina. And now it's time for Hot Topics in the News. When do you counsel your students that they need to inform their colleges if they have a curriculum or schedule change in 12th grade? Oh, I require it's required of counselors for us to do that. Um, so the student needs to do that as well. So there's actually two scenarios here where the student and the counselor needs to be involved. Um, so when it comes to your, so when you apply to college, we counselors fill out what's called a school report form. It, it goes with the common app. MIT has their own version on their own application platform. Georgetown has their own version. So every application platform requires a school report form. So this is where I put in information about my school in case they're not going to read the profile or they just need a quick hit. Um, but in that, I also um, describe what your 12th grade classes are if they're not on your transcript. And then after issuing that school report form, if there's any changes to it, I am required to reflect those changes when it comes to the mid-year report, which is required by all of your colleges. Regular, early, whatever it be, it's required by our colleges. Um, not the University of California system, though. So, sure. um, uh, And maybe some other large state schools. But um, so in that form, they ask me, have there been any changes to the student's um, schedule? And so I have to say yes. And there has to be an explanation as to why that got changed. Um, and so it is also makes sense for the student to provide an explanation as well on their end. Um, I think that student piece is really important because remember, as a student, you've also said on your common app what your senior year courses were. Exactly. And you don't want to look like you're trying to get over um, on a school or, you know, it's just it's just not it's just a bad look if there's no communication from a student, in my opinion. Right. Yeah. It is paperwork. It's documentation and you falsely documented something. So you do want to be clear. The other time a student I require my students to do this is that let's say you were admitted early decision or early action before maybe you could make a course change to second semester or something like that. Um, and you've deposited or you're definitely going to that school. You, the student, need to call admissions and get permission from them about those course changes, because what could be terrible 
is that either when I report as the counselor, you have, a, you have a course change or they get your final transcript and they see a course change, they will rescind your offer because they admitted you on the proposed courses that for senior year that you gave them. So I would say more often than not, most of the time the switches is really fine with the colleges. And in the worst case scenarios, you talk to someone random for five minutes and they're like, yep, you know, but I will say this, I've had um, plenty of conversations where my area rep had to go to the dean to get permission. Um, and, the, and the student was told no. Um, and because it really did you know, maybe they dropped a level or maybe they didn't take a core class. And now you're applying with a very different academic profile uh, or not. Now you're you're in the class with a different academic profile than you were admitted for. So you do need to call the admissions office as a student. And I know that might sound weird. If you go to an independent school or perhaps you have a college counselor at your public school, that person can help navigate that for you. Um, as well. But if you're maybe on your own, it, it is totally fine to just call up the frontline admissions, just the main number and say like, hi, I'm an admitted student or I'm a deposited student um, for the class of whatever. Um, I would like to make a course change before I do so. Could I speak with an admission officer about, uh, you know, about if that's okay or not? Yeah. And I haven't had a lot of experience where people did have something rescinded. Mostly that's because they're talking to me about it because I'm on the counseling Great. side, right? But knowing how I know admissions works, see if you would agree with this, Julia, there would definitely be a correlation between the severity of the decision and the selectivity of the school. Like when you, yes, like when totally. you have, yeah, like when you yeah. have some schools that still have ED, but they have more generous admit rates. Yeah. My, my experience is that it, they wouldn't definitely rescind. Yes. But, yeah. I had, yeah. yep, exactly. So I had, I'm thinking of, and I had in the class of, uh, two years ago, I had two students both admitted to different places. Ed, one was Bennington College, mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. one was Brown. <laughs> mm, yeah, I can imagine how that was a different yeah, response. <laughs> exactly, Bennington <laughs> laughed at me when I asked, for <laughs> and they were like, "This makes us love the applicant more." Yeah. What do you mean they <laughs> want to take math and they want to take more That's art? So funny. <laughs> <laughs> and I was like, "All right, well, I was just checking, you know." And the student. <laughs> The student also got a great merit aid package. Sure. So I also wanted to make sure that didn't sure, change sure. based on her um, application. Um, and then Brown was the, our area rep said, I have to go ask Logan Powell, the, mm -hmm. the dean. Oh. And, <laughs> well, he went all the way to Logan. <laughs> yep. Yep. All the way. So this took some time in their office. And by the time they got back to me, they were like, absolutely not. No. And if that student did that, then we'd have to talk to the student about if they're coming here next year. Yeah. Yeah, that's such a great story. I'm glad yeah. you. I'm glad you <laughs> name names because I think it helps people. To yeah, get a sense. I think so too. Yeah. And it was funny. And I'm really, by the way, both of my students were awfully patient, so I appreciate them. <laughs> awesome. Thank you, Julia. Thank you. And now it's time for a question from one of our listeners. Friends, last week, our roundtable took on the topic of glimpse and video submission and a question from our listener. And that was a long discussion. So we're going to finish up right now with part two. But before we get to it, we've had three glimpse questions sent in just this week. So I've reached back out to Terry and Gloria Crawford. Uh, you may remember about a year ago, I interviewed them. They're the founders of Initial View. They're the ones who have launched the Glimpse product. And um, I've asked them to come back on just to get a perspective of where are we going? Because, for example, right now, the 50 QuestBridge schools have rolled out Glimpse. So just in a really short period of time, it's spreading and it's spreading pretty quickly amongst highly selective schools. Listen and enjoy. Hi, Mark. I'm a mom in New England. I really love your show. I have a question about video responses that some colleges are asking for now. I've seen some schools like Brown and Bowdoin and Swarthmore have this option, but I'm pretty sure there must be other schools doing this now as well. The websites often say they are optional video responses, but I guess I'm wondering, is optional really optional? Do you have any advice about whether to submit a video or not? For example, what should a student consider in deciding whether to do a video? Finally, do you recommend any resources to students who plan to do this? 
Thank you so much for your advice and for your podcast. What are your thoughts on um, students not doing these? Like, you know, there's many schools that don't require them, make them optional. Um, uh, what, what that's you what I was think? thinking of. Is it an interest test? Yeah. Is it an is it an interest test? Are you are you demonstrating disinterest by passing on it? What are your thoughts? Yeah, I hope that I hope that offices will be really transparent and honest about how they're using it and whether it's a test of interest so that students know what they're supposed to do. But I think that students who feel comfortable doing the video should go for it. And if you don't feel comfortable, if you don't think that you come across well on video, um, after be- having an honest, you know, conversation with your parents or counselor or somebody about it, then then if you're not comfortable, don't do it. But it could be a missed opportunity, right? Mm-hmm. Yeah, and then you can hire a professional coach to, you know, <laughs> oh, come in and, and help you plan it and shoot it and uh well, there's there's yeah. a, that was sarcastic. Nobody, they just say, you know, this is not advocating. No, for that. don't do that. No, no, yeah. no. I was being, I was being so. I appreciate what Hillary yeah. was saying, however, because I think, I think it probably is a missed opportunity. And kids also need to understand that being something other than a raving extrovert is okay. Yes. Mm-hmm. And Absolutely. All, you know, we've all spent a lot of time interviewing teenagers in various parts of our careers and the the you know it is it is there isn't like a continuum of good personalities and bad personalities there are some things that are (laughs) that are intentional that can be challenging in a get to know you situation but um I, i think a glimpse into an activity that you love even if you're the most introverted or shy person, you know, uh, at your high school, invite, invite the person to into that part of your life and make Mm -hmm. it something that you really care about because that's going to show. Yeah. Yeah. I think it's actually a kind of a neat opportunity for those super introverted kids who may not show like tons of leadership on their activities list or may not come across as dynamically in their application it's we want thoughtful students, right? We want the students who are really good listeners and who think before they speak. And um, I think that a, a 90 second video is an opportunity for a student who is thoughtful to come across that way um, on the video that may not come across in the rest of their application. It feels to me like it would be naive to think that no schools are not using it as somewhat of an interest test. Yeah. I just I just see too many schools using different things for interest, and I partly understand that in a competitive world, when you're trying to figure out who's serious about you and who's not, especially if you're whatever getting one out of seven in regular admissions or whatever. I get I do get that. Um, you know, you have to be careful. I get it. You know, playing God or being judge and jury when it may not be wrong, but I understand that. But you know, it reminds me also of when schools say you know optional essay. I, I think it's mm-hmm. risky to <laughs> yeah, to, no. to pass on that and not at least you know and it's also I think from a school standpoint at least some schools if we tell you all the different ways we're testing interest then you know we'll right. people will just game the results and we'll not we'll not right. be able to tell if it's interest or not so right. I also ru- get that ruins, side of it too <laughs> it ruins the algorithm correct it ruins the algorithm. <laughs> You know, but I, I love your, you know, advocating for sort of integrity and full transparency. I, I get that, Hillary. I think I do think if the truth be were told and everybody knew all the different ways that some schools test interest, they'd probably be a little mm-hmm. concerned about big, big brotherism, you know? I mean, I, I do remember sitting in a Duke info session. This was back when there were still SAT subject tests. Sure. Ooh, and the I'll admission go. rep said, like, if we say it's optional, it's optional, meaning that like, if you can't access this thing, then we don't expect you to do it. But if you can access an SAT subject test, if if you can write an essay <laughs> that's supposedly, you know, optional, you need to write the essay. And that, I guess that makes sense for a school with that um, selective of a process. Um, and and so for the for the video, like I really think that student students should think hard about how is 
it really like, do you, do you have an accessibility issue or something that would keep you from doing it? Or do you have, you know, anxiety to the point where this is really going to set you back? Um, because it's an opportunity to show colleges something great about yourself. And I would just recommend taking advantage of it. Do yeah. you all anticipate the rise of this? I mean, we've seen, you know, significant rise in the last mm-hmm. couple of years, but at the other, on the other hand, that's coming from a certain slice of the college mm-hmm. landscape that's in that highly, highly selective, um, you know, bucket, right? Like anytime you mm-hmm. add additional requirements on, I think schools that are even moderately selective, they worry. Am I going to have decreased applications if I put another yeah. thing on somebody? And I'd rather get, I'd rather work with a bigger funnel, and then, you know, and get them into our our admissions funnel, and then maybe we can have another student connect with them or get them on campus or something, and 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 eventually they end up at the school. So it'd be surprising to see schools outside of the the highly selective do this. Uh, so it appears to be growing, but mostly growing in that sector. It's, would you all agree with that, or do you have a different take? No, I, I I would agree, and I think I think you see colleges playing it, you know, both ways. You saw, you know, Washu when they added questions, their apps fell, they pulled back, mm-hmm. they started interviewing. Recently, they pulled out of interviewing. They were interviewing in the yeah. summer, and now it's a video. Um, and even with Northwestern, you have they had this such an interesting message to applicants that, you know, we really care about the supplements. We, we are not going to, we don't feel obligated to send us your main essay. What? <laughs> I just was like, I, 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 I was confused because I thought to myself, really, did you really admit somebody who didn't submit a main essay? Really? I don't know. But they, but they're trying to have it both ways. Like, Oh, we realize how busy you are. And, Please repurpose this. They literally said that in in the message. Wow. Repurp- repurpose this, but really spend your time on those supplements. I was confused. I mean, I think every wow, school so wrestles with like how, for lack of a better word, onerous do we want to make our application? But then we get a a pretty, you know, self-selected group of people that we know have some interest in us. Obviously, extremes are people like Georgetown and MIT literally making you do an application, right? But then we have other extremes. I mean, look how many questions Brown has or Stanford yes. has or my Princeton. goodness, your years, honors college may be the worst. It's ridiculous. Like <laughs> two 800-word essays, almost nine or 10 essays. Like there's, so there's extremes like that. And then we have also some other very selective schools that don't ask for anything. And I think, you know, you see schools fiddle with that model do we, we we know we'll get more apps but we know there'll be there'll be some people that just threw us on there because it was no additional work and all of us as counselors literally have people say that to us all the time oh it's no additional work sure i'll do that or oh this one's too much work i don't want to do it we hear that all the time on the counseling side yeah and so i can understand on the admission side how that that's a tough call like do i want to get more people into my funnel and I know my yield's going to go down, but maybe with some, with some effective outreach, some of those people that wouldn't have applied may end up, you know, I'll not just say may end up, I'll say will end up as students at our school, but yet there's a lot of manpower. Do you want to expend that much manpower for a lower yield? And you literally can see schools fiddle around with that model. Like, okay, we'll add a question. We'll make it harder, but we'll get more of a pre screen person. We'll increase our yield, but we'll get less apps. And I can imagine that that would not be an easy decision to make, knowing like how to strike that balance. You can literally see schools fiddle with that from year to year to sort of get the right mix for them. Any any thoughts on that uh, from any any of you? Well, it's, you know, the weirdness of questions showing up now post application. Oh, yes. In the portals, Mark, that's not exactly to your to your point, but I think it's another strategy that colleges are using to attract applicants up front and then hitting them with the extra work. And I think that's where a lot of these glimpses and videos are going is into yes. portals. They're not, you know, you're not sending them with your your application. They're they're being uploaded later. I think it is on point, though, Susan, because it it speaks to 
partly to the fear of if we front load with too many requirements, we'll scare them away. But we still really, really want the information. So get or, them. Or that to me feels like an interest test, right? Because yeah. a kid's not really going to be checking their portal very often if they're not interested in a school. And so they're not going to see those things pop up. Um, that feels like a little bit. Yes, we're looking for more information. But really, are you how engaged are you with us? Yeah, yeah. Right. You know, personally, I, I like the Amherst approach much more. Where like they they're up very upfront with the fact that you know once you submit, you're gonna unlock something, versus the blindsidedness approach of you had mm -hmm. no idea, you thought you were done, and then yeah. and then you got a why question into your portal. That feels a little sneaky. So Amherst warns the applicant of that, but doesn't tell them what the assignment is going to be. Yeah. Yeah. Mm, interesting. That's a little bit icky. Good yeah. to know. Well, but at a... least it's um, at least there's transparency that you know that something's coming versus blindsided. I've also seen, you know, in these portals, because you know there are some students who are really good about checking into their portals. Some students don't realize that there's more being like there's all this stuff appearing in there, and they're trying to like entice you. I remember um, Babson dropped this interview. And you had a week to respond to the to the request, and yep, I remember and that. Luckily, we saw it. I, I was just like, <laughs> I don't know. Anyway, so I, I I I don't like the surprises because they're you're dealing with with students who have different abilities to organize the process. Mm -hmm. Yep, it's also yeah, a little unfair to me too. Like, I think you do. I think a student has a right to assess the amount of work in an application as part of their decision of whether they, whether or not they they want to apply, mm -hmm. right? Especially it, if they're paying me, an application fee. Yes. Yeah. Yes. To that me, would make yes. me mad if I Yeah, because you guys like don't a, have app fees, so you would probably really, you're yeah. really sensitive. You pay, pay your yeah, 80 bucks. Yeah, but and I, then if you're... I had to pay $80 for an application fee, and I thought it was a low bar app, but just a high application fee, and then I found out that there was more to it, I'd be annoyed for sure. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, it feels almost to me the equivalent of like, you know, you sign up for a class and you see the syllabus and you think you know what what's yes. involved, and then middle of semester mm -hmm. you get find out oh there's another twenty page paper like that. Feel, yeah, so uh, it's just yeah. it feels a little icky to me that part. I know? almost didn't graduate from college for that very reason, Mark. <laughs> <laughs> That's a there's story. A story there, Susan. Yeah, it I wasn't a twenty it. page paper. It was uh, something else that was not a publicized requirement wow. of the class. So wow, I I am sensitive to that. Well, we're glad you did. You may not be here today. Your life might have been on a different trajectory. <laughs> yeah, I never I never told my parents about that. <laughs> <laughs> Smart. And now this week's interview with a special guest. Brands in part two, Jay elaborates on something he said last week. The importance of understanding the performance side of prepping for the ACT or the SAT. Next, Jay gives his advice on whether students should do self-prep, group test prep, or one-on-one -on -one test prep. Jay talks about how many times a week a student should meet with their test prep tutor. And Jay talks about how you have to prepare differently when you're preparing for an adaptive test. Friends, Jay reached out to me after we had done our recording and he said, I don't feel as if I fully explained testing his performance as well as I wanted to. So I said, Jay, go to speakpipe.com. And whatever you didn't say, just say it there. Click the record button, and I'll insert it into the interview. So here is Jay elaborating on testing as performance. I want to elaborate a bit about the concept of taking the SAT or ACT as a performance. Too many students think about taking these tests as a school test where you review information, cram it into your brain, and then uh, come, come time for the taking the test, you spill it out onto the paper or tap the keys on the computer if it's given to you by computer. And um, students 
should, however, think more about it as a performance. It's about timing. It's about pacing. It's about not wasting time on individual questions. It's about honing your skills on doing multiple choice questions and then speeding them up uh, so that you can get as many questions correct in a limited amount of time without making careless errors. It's a performance that involves several factors beyond just knowing the material and expressing the material on the test. I have two analogies for test prep that tie into testing as a performance. One analogy I use is testing and test prep is similar to the experience of a performing artist giving a performance. For example, um, a performing artist such as a singer, a musician, a dancer, an actor, goes through a certain process to make sure that their performance is as good as it can possibly be, approaching perfection, if that's attainable. And the process that they use in uh, improving their performance and optimizing their performance is rehearsal. And every artist of integrity, every performance or performing artist of integrity emphasizes a thorough and disciplined rehearsal process where they go through all aspects of their performance, trying to perfect each aspect. Um, if it's a violinist, um, it's doing the three movements of the piece that she's playing, each one uh, being a little different, but honing the skills that make those particular parts of the entire performance as good as they can possibly be. And here's a key. No performing artist will shortcut the preparation through rehearsal necessary to give their optimal performance. So it's, if it's a helpful to a student to think about test prep and taking the test as rehearsal for a performing artist in giving their best possible performance at a, uh, at a concert or even uh, in uh, a recording studio, that analogy can help. A second analogy that I think is helpful to students about testing and test prep is sports. Athletes go through a process to optimize their performance in the game, the match, the uh, contest, whatever it is. And that process is practice and training. And no performing artist with integrity will shortcut the discipline, practice, and training that they need to give their best possible performance. And through that practice and training, they will try to sharpen each and every aspect of that performance. And as I said, in test taking uh, for the SAT and ACT, that's the ability to do multiple choice questions better and faster while knowing the material, knowing the content. And those are uh, the various aspects of um, an optimal performance uh, on the SAT or ACT. And it's also practicing those factors extensively enough so that you come into the test confident that your skills are at their best. Not that you're going to get a perfect score, but you're going to get your best score. And that should be the goal of every test taker, to get their best score and to do what's necessary in preparation to be in a position to get that best score. So I want to talk to you about multiple different approaches I've seen students take to prepping. And I want to get your, your thoughts on them. I'm going to kind of cover a big range here. So there's the group test prep classes. There's both in-person classes and online. And then I've seen large group, I would call large 25 to 30. And then I've seen more six to 10. So that I'm throwing them all out here, Jay, and then I'm going to have you kind of walk through and comment on all of them. So that's that's one approach. 
I should have started all the way on the other extreme, which is just self prep using like a Khan Academy or something like that and completely doing self prep without a tutor. So there's that model, there's the classes. And then what one company I used to work with would call their six pack, meaning you do the classes and then they tag on six hours of individual one on one, like micro targeted to a student's need. And then there's just one on one. I'd love to get your thoughts on those because I've I've seen people use all of those successfully, depending on the kid. But have you looked at any research on either score gains or ones that you tend to think tend to be better from those models? Just kind of talk to me about like, where take it where you want to go. Like, is there a kid that you feel is good for this one, but maybe not that one? I want to leave it open-ended for you to go where you want to go with it, but I'd love your feedback on, just in summary, we've got lar- we've got so- self-prep exclusively using something like Khan Academy. We've got large class in person or Zoom, small, and I'm calling small, four, four to eight, four to ten-ish, you know, and then we've got class coupled with maybe six hours of one-on-one and then just one-on-one. Tell me your thoughts. Okay, you've opened up a, a wide. I know. I know. Uh, for, for, <laughs> I'm expecting you to just talk for a while because I threw a lot out there <laughs> to uh, motor down here, but I'll I'll take it on. First, you met you use the word research in there, and I have to remind you, the it's research limited. is mostly survey research. That's fine. I think it's I think it's weak, and yep. <laughs> and so. We'll go with your anecdotal. You've been doing this sure. multi decades. Sure, and and if if an anecdotal is, I think the anecdotal data that I have is better than the survey. Re, you know, the research, and I use air quotes, survey stuff, which just is unimpressive. So when a student asked me, Jay, how should I prep? You know, and and. I, I, I first asked what the options are that are available to the individual student. And they range on the high expensive end, one-on-one tutoring for six weeks, you know, how many, two, three sessions a week. That's really expensive. Most people, the large majority of students can't afford that. To the other end, the almost free end, which is involves a book, um, self-prepping from a book, and then having a source of questions, which in the pre-digital age was another book, a college board book or ACT book with, you know, four, five, six, seven full practice tests. So, and I talk to um, groups where low-income kids predominate. So I always emphasize the almost free method. So let me let me flesh that out for you. Um, and that's that's a method, Mark, sadly, which for a lot of kids is the only thing they have access to because they just don't have any resources. First of all, I always say that if your school runs a course that's cheap or free, take it. Um, it may only be okay, uh, it may not be great, but having a formal format where you have to show up, and I'm yeah, most most courses that like this, I'm sure you're aware, kind of three, four Saturday morning kind of things. I would assume that most of them uh, are still in person, those kinds of uh, things, although maybe you can advise me to the contrary. But uh, if your school offers that kind of course, take it. It's likely not going to be enough and provide all your needs, particularly if it's three Saturday mornings for two hours each. That's just, if you think that that's sufficient for SAT prep, you fall way short of my recommended time expenditure. Um, But that you can, you have good resources uh, to do self prep. I should interject. I always prefer to see a teacher involved, but given that you can't afford a teacher or given that you're doing the three Saturday mornings for two hours and that's not enough, 
um, the way to prep or the way to supplement that prep is to get a good, what I call a methods book. Princeton Review, Kaplan, there are a dozen methods books. And those are the books that are an inch and a half uh, thick and that describe the different question types and suggest to you how methods for doing those que questions. That's why I call them methods books. And they also have a couple of practice tests in them uh, written by either Princeton Review or Kaplan or one of the other major test prep companies. And those, those uh, practice tests in those books are okay to use. Um, they're not the very best, but they're entirely sufficient uh, for your purpose, which is to get some practice on questions that look very, very, very much like real SAT or AC questions. That's the methods book. Now you need, the, the methods book typically doesn't have enough practice questions or full practice tests for you to do a complete prep, because as I said, I like four, four ish practice tests, and then you need more questions to practice on. Um, so you need a source for those questions. And as I said, there is a College Board book and an ACT book um, with, I think it both have at least four full practice tests, um, sometimes more, and then additional practice questions. And there are practice questions in the methods book. So you have practice questions there. That's enough for most students. Those two books are enough for most students to uh, do a, a good SAT or ACT prep. Now, what, how that advice has shifted in the last uh, year or two is a student who's taking a, an SAT in the online, you know, uh, in, in the digital format on a computer, and a student is taking the ACT, who's taking ACT on a computer, must do all their practice tests on a computer and must do most of their just drilling, practicing answering certain kinds of questions that they're issue, having issue with. You know, that's what you do between the, pra between the practice tests. Um, have to do most of that on computer too. So those students would need a computer-based uh, source of questions, and those are available. And you know, there's there's free practice. Full, you can get four or five full free practice tests by signing up to different websites. You know, Prince Review and Kaplan typically uh, have single free tests. So a student, a resourceful student, can uh, who doesn't have really uh, any uh, financial resources. Um, can can access enough practice material, but that that is a distinction. If you're taking the ACT and pencil and paper, again, you want to do the large majority of your practice questions in pencil and paper. You can do some, uh, you know, some on the computer, but you should mo do most of them pencil and paper. It, again, it's the reverse um, with a student prepping for the uh, for the computer delivered test. Want to do mo you need to do all your practice uh, practice tests on a computer, and you should do most of your practice drilling and, and questions between tests on a computer. So those are those are the parameters. So obviously, the new SAT is an adaptive test, right? Which is different than before. Yeah. So are you encouraging that they test using in you know set up with the adaptive format because that's what they're going to be doing on the real test? Well, uh, yes, absolutely. And you get a practice adaptive test. Now, there, the adaptive test is not a new concept. And we've been dealing with that particularly adaptive format on the GRE for a long time. Uh, and it involves a peculiarity, I would say, that, that doesn't exist on a non-adaptive test. And that is that uh, the way it works I'm not sure you want to get in. Do you want to get a little bit into the weeds? Sure. On this? We, have a weeds we have a weedsy audience that listens to us because we're weedsy. Uh, right. Well, this is this is a like a third level, something of third level importance. But it is necessary for a student to understand mainly to combat misinformation that they'll hear from other students. And I'm always on the alert for 
how's a student going to be led astray because they're here some weird stuff from another student that just will reduce their score? So the way the adaptive uh, process works on the SAT, and there are different adaptive models. The, G, the GMAT has an entirely diff, different adaptive model. So you need to know the adaptive model you're dealing with. On the SAT, which is similar to the GRE, you have two math sections and two verbal sections. And the only thing that's adaptive is the second of each section, the second math section and the second verbal section. So you're taking two of the four sections you're taking, two of them are not adaptive. So two of them are just like, like a pencil and paper test lifted up onto the computer. Same stuff. So, the, so you're taking your first math section, same stuff as it would be if you took it in pencil and paper. Nothing different. Where the difference comes in is the second math section, because the difficulty level of that section is based on how you did on the first section. And the problem that arises is the student on the second math section, I mean, the first math section, everybody's kind of taken something similar. So this concern doesn't arise. But on the second math sec section, it's problematic if a student is trying to analyze whether that section is more difficult or easier than the first section to try to psych out how they're doing and while they're thinking about all that, they can't possibly be 100% attuned to what they're doing, and they're lowering their score. So there's a, the, a student needs to develop on the second section if they're aware of how the adaptive works, and they will be because other students will tell them stuff that may or may not be correct. What they need to do is just suspend completely that curiosity, just so it's for another time and another place, and I'm going to spend 100% of my attention on getting as many questions correct in the second section as I can. And, you know, that's a psychological factor that, again, students work on or should for four practice tests, and hopefully they'll get better on and come out at the end of the third or fourth practice test in the prep saying, you know, I really didn't spend much attention as to how, what the difficulty level was and the questions on the second math section and the second verbal section, I just really focused on getting as many questions as I, I can correct. And so that's, the, you, have, you have time to kind of work on that and sort it out a little bit so that on the real test, you're not, you're not dis, it's a distraction. It's simply a distraction to try to figure out whether those questions are harder or easier because it's irrelevant to, to how you actually do on the test. And more than irrelevant, it takes brain power and attention away from the way you should be spending. I want to come back to sort of was talking about individual groups. So I've often said to students, if they can afford individual, these are the advantages to it. I've said one, maximum accountability. There's absolutely nowhere to hide. Everyone's going to know what you've done or haven't done through the week, which can, you know, hopefully help you if you need a more of an incentive to do what you need to do. Secondly, the teaching can be totally customized to your need as opposed to sitting in a group class and you've already mastered that concept. So that last 30 minutes was nice, but not necessary. And then the third thing, if your best friend, Becky, has a birthday party at seven on Sunday, and that was your group meeting time. Well, they're not changing the class because of the birthday party, but individually, you could probably work out, uh, hey, this week, can we do it another time? So I've, and and then I, the research, I've always, well, I don't want to use that word research, Jay, because I know how shoddy it is. The data, we'll use the word data, okay? The data the test prep companies tends to put out when they do it has always said, okay, you can maybe on average expect this kind of score gain from from um one on one versus group we see this kind of score gain i've certainly i've worked with 14 companies over the last 15 20 years and i've seen seen that kind of data put out from several of them so that's kind of what i've said when resources are not an issue 
But I have also noticed there is a kid, and I have several of them every year, that absolutely crush the test just by doing their own self-prep. I've even had kids who have paid for one-on-one and then told me they like self-prep because they can do it completely on their own time. They know what they need to work on. It's a certain kind of kid because they're obviously they have a lot of self-discipline and drive. But some of those kids are the kids that are getting the 1550 to 1600s. I've noticed mm. in the 35s and 36s on the ACT. So just tell me what your thoughts kind of are on that. Like, does that general advice make sense if resources are not an issue for one-on-one or is it entirely depend on the person? Tell me your thoughts. Yeah, let me tell you how I advise students who ask me, what should I do? And I don't know anything about them. I'll, I'll ask them some questions and try to get a general idea. And if you're talking to a student about the SAT, for example, and they can tell you their PSAT score, you sort of know what zone, uh, general zone you're operating in. But it's interesting. When you asked me those questions, I told you only what the lowest resource student, what their options are for that student, because those are most of the students that I've been talking to for the last 15 years, actually for the last uh, 25 years. And yeah, and I get questions from from students who have some who have some financial ability to pay for something, and so the the distinction I usually draw, Mark, is individual one on one tutoring, if you can afford it, is what most students who can afford it benefit benefit most from. There are there are exceptions, and I'll, I'll, I'll outline those in a moment. Because as you point out, it's personalized, customizable. You're only spending time, you know, if you're just killing the geometry on on the math side, you're not spending any time on that with your tutor. Um, If you're in a course, the course will spend time on that because they'll cover all the uh, the different question types. So it's the fact that it's customizable, the fact that you're on a schedule that can be adjusted, as you pointed out, if there's a conflict, makes it really nice. What it's missing is the energy and question of other, questions of other students. And what I've told students, and I've had students go in different directions, is the courses are going to be a certain number of weeks before the test, uh, f- often five to six weeks. You'll find 10-week courses, nah, I'm not, <laughs> don't go there. You'll find three-week courses, nah, don't go <laughs> there. Try to find something in, in, the, in the five to six, seven-week zone even, if you can. And if you're unclear about whether you want to uh, tutor or take a class, try the class uh, and... Uh, uh, but but have an eye, perhaps have a tutor lined up or be willing to uh, switch to a tutor if in the first class or two you're sensing, you know, I'd rather just have a tutor because at five or six weeks out, you'll you'll tend to have enough time for a tutor. Now, if you're really to to improve your score. Now, if you're really, you know, assuming you're meeting with the tutor twice a week or maybe maybe even a little more than that, not any less than that, you'll have considerable tutoring time. And again, remember, the three weeks before the test are the most important time uh, for prep and the three weeks prior to that, second most important time for that. When students talk to me about preparing for 10 or 15 or 20 weeks, I say, you can do that, but each three-week period further away from the test is less important. So how much time do you want to put in in a less important time frame? And if that weakens your energy and ability to really put in the primary effort in the six weeks and the three weeks before the test, then you're weakening your prep by diluting your energy for the more more important time period. So there's that. But um, so I've done that. Uh, if you if if you're uh, debating between a tutor and a course, start the course, make arrangements that you can drop after the first class or two, 
create that option for yourself and then and then uh, go for a tutor if the if you don't feel positively about the uh, class that's a way to kind of sample the two um the online um the online self paced is self prep um so that that uh, i cover you, you know that has the same dynamic your as the the methods book and the and the and the test question book um you're getting that stuff online but yourself but it it's you're still doing self prep having a course online adds the factor of how do you respond to a course online versus if you can get one an in person course and that's you know personal preference of i'm giving you a choice you can take this by coming to a classroom or, or uh, you know, watching somebody in a little box like you and I are right now, what do you, what do you, what do you prefer? What are you more comfortable with? And you know, students will make different choices. So those, the, the uh, another thing I would avo- avoid you. Uh, it, so when I say class, you want a class of like 10 or 12 if you can get it. And it's it's probably harder. It was easier back in the day. It's probably the economics probably make that pretty hard to do today. But in the context of like a six week course, you want a, cl- a, a class size that's small enough that the teacher within a week, you know, a couple of sessions can have a good sense of who you are and can make an experienced teacher can make some suggestions. If you're in a class of 25, you have to come after class uh, to get any one-on-one. And then, you know, the, the, the class is too big for the teacher to have any sense of who you are. So, so the things that you're balancing are the one-on-one attention and the efficiency and the personalized focus versus a small class where the teacher can get to know you not quite as well, not quite, not fast enough, but can get to know you pretty well in a week or two of a class of 10 or 12. And you have the energy of the other students and the, you know, the addition, the additional drive, the sort of implied competition, you know, you want, you want to show yourself well, because there are other folks around those can be motivating forces that are that are absent in a one-on-one tutoring. And then, as I said, I think a larger class just loses so much. You still have a teacher. And if you have maybe six hours of tutoring, as you mentioned, maybe that cuts cuts the difference that, I'm, you know, bridges the difference that I'm talking about. Um, but the two of the basic factors are individual focus without any kind of group energy versus group energy that has the potential for some kind of individual focus and which, you know, which, which of those two formats, um, you know, and some students just shrug and say, well, I'll do both. I'll take a course and then I'll do a couple of weeks of tutoring, you know, and if you have the resources, um, that might be the best. Friends, this concludes this part of my interview with Jay Rosner. I hope you join us next week for the next part. And now it's time for our College Spotlight of the Week. Friends, last week, Linda and Lisa delighted us with a great conversation about Furman University in Spartanburg, South Carolina. This week, you'll hear part two. And if you enjoy Lisa and Linda and their reports from these colleges they're out visiting and their banter back and forth, our next two spotlights also have Linda and Lisa. I'm not going to tell you the schools. You got to tune in, but I'll give you a hint. One is in Colorado and one is in Indiana. All right. So there's a lot of school spirit. People are going to games. Um, and there's a lot of just sports in general, a lot of intramural sports. I think a large percentage of the kids do an intramural sport. Um, they also, a large percentage of the kids go on study abroad and they have, you know, like mo- most schools, but I think it's a little more involved. They have the typical like short one as you go in on it, like a May semester, you can go for a semester, you can go for a year. There are shorter ones that maybe are part of a class. So um, they really want you to get out there into the world and, and do a study abroad. Um, so I think 
they say that they have a 98% placement rate in six months for graduates, 86% for your graduation rate, which is pretty good. Um, and I think that's where that um, Furman Advantage program probably really helps with that. It's about 70000 cost of attendance, but nobody pays that. So they do meet need, and I think they say they meet 100% of need. Um, really? But I don't know, like, that's how they define need, need right? So sure. I don't really know how that exactly plays out. But lots of merit aid. Um, in addition to, like, the merit aid, there's eight full-ride scholarships a year. Um, and my tour guide, the last time, he was on one of those full scholarships. And so there are opportunities there to even increase your merit aid. Questions about what I've said so far? So, you know, just a, a couple of things, you know, talking about students getting lost. Um, I think that residential college, again, you can't fall through the cracks at a school like that. And if you have to attend uh, activities in order to graduate, it's very easy just to walk over there. Yeah. And, you, you know, you're going to you're going to meet people. And I can see a place like this would be good for a shy student, uh, somebody who is maybe a little bit introverted because you can't hang out in the dorm all the time, even if it is, you know, nice. You got to get out and attend some of those fun activities. So uh, they're still test optional, right? Yes. That was, and I think they're getting increasingly selective. So the statistics on their acceptance rates kind of are all over the place. Some places they'll say 68%, some place 50%. I think on their website, they said it was 40% last year. Um, they do have ED, but not that many people use it. Most people do the EA round. Um, in fact, your chances are worse in the ED round than in the EA round, I think, because they're holding space. And then RD is going to be a little bit less. But, you know, it's still, I think, you know, a, a decent student would have a pretty good shot at being admitted to Furman. Um, so it can accommodate, you know, a wide variety of students, I think. So you shouldn't not apply because you got to be in history class no, in sophomore no. year. No, I, I would. I think they'll be okay with that. Probably. I don't want to speak for the Furman admissions office, but you know, um, it's not like the you know the highly rejective schools where you know you sneezed one day in class and now it's over for you. <laughs> you know, <laughs> you just ruined all your chances. They don't require letters of rec, um, um, but. They'll read up to three. And I guess they, they, the main, main thing that they look at is your rigor of your curriculum. They want to know that you can um, handle the rigorous classes that they have there at Furman. They love reading your personal essays. That's really emphasized um, to work on your essay. Um, so they look at your extracurriculars. If they say that if you are test optional, then they'll look at your GPA a little more um, and how you did in school. But um, I think like a, more than 50% of their class is test optional. So a lot of people go test optional. Do they have a supplemental essay? No. Okay. They do not. Okay. So a fairly, uh, it's not one of those overly involved applications. Um, <laughs> We all love those. What does diversity look like at a school of that size? Yeah, that is something that they are working on. You know, Furman, I think, has been known as like a white conservative, maybe upper middle class, upper class school in the South for a long time. But they, I think the school has gone more centrist um, in terms of its politics, and they are really trying hard to recruit people of color. Um, and that is one of their um, things that they're doing. So I think it's like 79% white. And then um, there's, I think, 6% um, black. And then not that many Latinos or Asians right now. Um, they do have a lot of international students, though. So that's one other way that they try to have diversity. Got it. So when you think of, uh, about what kind of student would be successful here? 
what comes to your mind? Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's a great question. Um, I think that I think that this school, like you have to at least be a little interested in academics, like a little bit interested in the life of the mind, because I think that's going to be required of you. So you're going to work hard in these classes and they're going to expect a lot from you. Um, So, I mean, even though I think there is a thriving party life, I wouldn't call it a party school. But that being said, um, I think it's also for people who want a sense of community, or as you were saying, the shy kid who needs a sense of community (laughs) um, in order to blossom. And I think that, you know, people who like, like support and need support, I suppose there are some highly independent students who are like, I don't want to talk to my professor every day. I'm fine. And they are, you know, that might not be a good fit for them. But I think people who like interacting with their teachers, who that's part of how they learn, um, people who like discussion-based classes, and um, people who are interested in any kind of professional track after college, so pre-med, pre-law, maybe getting into getting your MBA, I think there's a lot of really great preparation for those tracks. Great. It sounds lovely. It looks yeah. lovely. You know, it's really, it's, so Mark and I argue about Furman all the time. (laughs) Well, not all the time, but whenever we talk about Furman, because, you know, Mark thinks it's too conservative for him. Mm -hmm. He went there and he asked one of the admissions officers, do you consider yourself a Southern school? And the man said, well, why? Yes, yes, we do. And I think Mark interpreted that to mean that they were, consider themselves a traditional Southern school with all the positives and negatives of that tradition. I don't necessarily get that sense, but it is in a very conservative area of South Carolina. Sure. And so it's really interesting because South Carolina is one of those states that when lots of people are moving from all over the country, but it's getting more conservative. People are picking South Carolina because they feel like it aligns with their political values, which is very different than North Carolina, which I think is getting more liberal. So, you know, I don't see that changing anytime soon. But that being said, um, I think Greenville has like some Democratic aldermen or town council members. And I mean, I think it's like maybe 45, 55, like 45 kind of vote blue and 55 yeah. vote red. So you're not going to be like by yourself. They have a, a democratic um, women's club. They have, you know, they have, they have a different organizations that Democrats have as they do with Republicans. So, um, you know, I just think that's something you have to keep in mind um, when, when you go there. Um, but that being said, um, like to me, <laughs> so, you know, for the teen perspective on this, and this is just one teen, my daughter really loved it. She loved Greenville. Mm-hmm. We stayed downtown overnight. She's like, why, when we moved to the South, why didn't we move here? <laughs> <laughs> the Chapel Hill, blah, you know, <laughs> and I, she makes a good, great point because it is beautiful and sophisticated. So you've got some culture and you've got nature and it's, it's a nice, you know, combination. it's, it's a really nice combination, yeah. but she really liked it. But, you know, my daughter, this daughter, unlike my oldest daughter is more academically interested. And so for her, you know, having a hard class is not going to be that much different than what she's doing in high school. Whereas for Lily, that would be kind of offensive to her. You want me to do what, you know? <laughs> um, so, but I think, you know, she really quite liked it. And she asked, cause they have an opportunity um, that you can go back and attend a class and oh. talk to some people like, you know, in the area that you think you're going to major in, you can talk to some of the professors. And she's like, yeah, I would like to do that. I would like to check that out to see if it's really a good So thing. you're going back to Furman again. Yeah. Yeah. Well, and plus we, you know, we've only eaten like four of those restaurants. <laughs> you know, there's a lot more eating that has to happen, I think. I'm down for those kind of challenges. Yeah, uh, absolutely. But, you know, it's not just for you guys, Sonia, because you know Greenville is consistently rated as one of the top southern towns, one of the best places to visit um, if you're going on vacation. I think it was in the New York. What is it? It's the New York Times that does the 52 places a year that you should go, I believe. And oh, they all do those. How big is Greenville? You know. 
that's a great question that I should have looked up before we're talking. I'm going to just say the number that comes to mind is between two and 300,000. Mm-hmm. Oh, okay. Actually, that's that's bigger than what I was thinking. But that could just be like something I just made up. So, oh, well, you know, I'm going to, you talk for a second. I'm going to Google this. No, um, nobody's coming we'll here to out. to uh, make sure that we get it right on the size of the metro area. Um, so I I trust you. Oh, wow. I was really wrong. 72,310. Oh, okay. So that's that's more in line with what I thought it was going to be like. <laughs> well, you know that I can't do math. Like your, your 72,000 and my 300,000, they're like the same number in my head, you know, <laughs> okay. but that's not actually accurate. So I, I'm sorry, Greenville. I misspoke. But, you know, um, when I was at the last visit um the tour guide we had a great tour guide he's really one i have to say one of the best tour guides i've ever had and i've had a lot of tour guides now um and you know he he asked what other schools sonia was looking at she told him she was looking at elon because her sister went there and he's like oh he's like i almost went to elon and then after the tour is over he the three of us just sat down and we just started you know comparing like and contrasting these schools because a lot of kids apply to both i mean he's not unique and sonia's not unique in that respect um because there's a lot of crossover and similarities between the two um, and I would say that Furman is better for the liberal arts, in my opinion, um, might be better for like pre-law, pre-med. They just seem to have more of a program. Not that Elon's not good for those things, but it just seemed a little bit more fleshed out, these programs. Um, but if, if, you know, Elon's just more applied, like they are so great at their business program. The business school is amazing. I mean, the communications school is phenomenal. Like really, I I don't think you can do any better than that um, for a communication school. So if you're interested in those fields, like, because he was saying that he was interested in communications a little bit. And I was like, yeah, but like Elon has an entire building with three floors. You have half a hallway. I mean, he showed us the hallway, (laughs) you know, like they have the studio. Elon has like three. I mean, it's just not a comparison of the opportunities. They have a lot more faculty in business. And so that's kind of what I would say. And Elon is a really fairly liberal. um, The college population is really fairly liberal. It's got a liberal ethos. It's known as being, you know, just accepting of a lot of different groups. Like it's one of the best schools for Jewish people. It's one of the best schools for LGBTQ. You know, it's consistently gets ranked highly. And I know Elon is not exactly diverse either. Um, (laughs) I was looking at this for something else. And I think the Asian population was 2%. And I'm like, oh, my, now that went down to 1% because it was my daughter, Lily, and that (laughs) other kid. And now they have to go find another kid. So I mean, they, they have work to do as well. But you know, the surrounding area of Elon is very conservative, you know. Um, And so, you know, but I just think like if you are more comfortable in that kind of environment, you might prefer Elon. So, you know, I would say that, you know, there's a lot of crossovers with Davidson and Wake Forest. Um, but I think it's not as quite as competitive to get into as Davidson and Wake Forest. Yeah. Um, and so, you know, that's, I think for, you know, not everyone can go to Davidson and Wake Forest. They have right. small acceptance rates and limited seats. So if you're interested in those kind of experiences, it's another great option. Well, again, it sounds great. I hope you didn't make that tour guide feel too guilty about. Oh no, no, okay. he felt great because he was like, at the end of the day, I got a full ride here. Well, that and I'm like, for a say lot. no more. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> you know, like, and he, you know, obviously, someone who was of the caliber of student and person who gets a full ride at any school. This guy was making his own way in the world, yeah, and he was fine. doing. He was just fine. He was very inspirational with all the different things that he was involved in. Um, And he wants to go into politics, and I think he'll be great. You know, um, really fabulous person. So, um, but yeah, no, it's definitely if you are interested in, you know, at all coming south and not dealing with the snow, it's one to look at. Sounds great. Thank you, Lisa. Oh, thank you, Linda, for going on this little journey with me. Always a pleasure. Friends, on Monday's episode, I'm going to continue giving you feedback from the NACAC conference with things I think that would just be of interest to you. 
And then we have a brand new interview. It's one I'm really excited about. It's one I've wanted to do for years. And it's with David Hawkins. And David Hawkins has been at NACAC for 24 years. And we're going to be talking about the state of college admissions. It's a report that uh, NACAC produces every year where they survey admission officers about what are the most important things in determining admission decisions. And then we're going to also talk about their survey research they do with high schools where they ask high school students, what do you think are the most important things that colleges use? when they're making admissions decisions. And we're gonna compare the two. What is the reality versus what is the perception? It's a long interview. We did a really deep dive on this. You'll hear it over the next five weeks, uh, but you're definitely gonna to wanna to tune in and hear David, who is the inaugural Chief Education and Policy Officer at NACAC. And friends, remember, it's not where you go. It's not where you go. It's not where you go, but it's what you do when you get there. It's what you do when you get out of there. That is what will determine your career success. See you on Monday, friends. And that's our show. A big thank you to you, our listeners, for tuning in this week. If you find this podcast helpful, please follow us and you'll get every single episode as soon as it is released. If you're interested, there are a few ways you can really support our podcast. You can click the share button and send it to your friends and acquaintances. You can help us pay our staff and our expenses by donating on our website. You can write a review for us on Apple or Spotify. I'm the producer of the podcast, but we have a fantastic team of 15. Shout out to our co-host, Dr. Lisa Ruff, Dr. David Williams, Linda Depker, Susan Tree, Vince Garcia, and Julia Esquivel and to our substitute co-host, Sylvia Borgo. Our sensational sound engineer is Nemanja Motvich. Our amazing music is from Victor Allen Weeks. Marketing designs are from Kimberly Blass. Lily Parikh manages our Instagram. Our image editor is Talha Khan. Joyce Ducker does our website episode updates. And our webmaster is Stylianos Dimitru. And if you want to have a coaching session with Lisa, Linda, or me, just text me at 404 404- 664-4340. If you have a question you want us to answer, or if you have a recommended resource or article you think we should discuss, just send it to questions at your collegeboundkid.com. Our favorite method is for you to record your own voice at speakpipe.com forward slash YCBK. By the way, check out our website where you'll find lots of content that is not on any podcast app. Our website is your collegeboundkid.com. If you want to learn about other hot admissions topics, follow us on Twitter at YCBK Podcast. We think of you as our listening family, and we look forward to meeting again with you every single Monday and Thursday.